Hello all, I'm Professor Drag Millich from the School of Public Health and Preventive Medicine um, and welcome to this uh, particular online presentation where we're going to do a rapid review of our critical appraisal skills. So here are the objectives for Module 4. As I mentioned, we're going to focus on reviewing our critical appraisal skills, um, this time um, with a focus on screening trials. So before we go through um, the, uh, the, I guess, the biases to look out for, for when, when um, critically appraising, I thought we would re review, I guess, the six main questions that we um, often ask um, uh, in, in evidence-based practice. Uh, so the first one um, is around itology, um, that is what caused the disease. Uh, the second one around diagnosis, um, and this question around diagnosis Oh yes, we just want to keep in mind that what we're trying to identify here is the um, effectiveness or, or accuracy um, of the diagnostic test um, itself. Um, prognosis, um, what is likely to happen to this patient. Um, question around harm, uh, so we're focusing on the risk factors um, and will exposure to a particular risk um, increase the likelihood of a particular um, outcome. Uh, effectiveness or questions around therapy, um, which um, we've mainly focused on um, in the evidence-based practice uh, program that we've developed. Um, so hopefully you should all be um, experts in this by now. Um, and finally, qualitative. So we haven't focused a whole lot on um, qualitative questions, but um, I just thought um, we'd, we'd put it out there just so um, it's in the back of your mind. So obviously with all of these types of questions, uh, we've got our toolkit um, in which we have our randomized controlled trials, cohort studies, case control, our surveys, our case studies or case series if there's a number of them, um, and not to also forget our systematic reviews. So whether they be a systematic review of randomized controlled trials, a systematic review of cohort studies, um, case uh, control studies, etc. So depending on the question, um, we can uh, choose one of that one of our um, studies from this toolkit to uh, to answer it. So what I thought I'd do just in this final slide is just run through an example um, based on our module um, uh, around screening and and what we've uh, decided to do is, is focus on this uh, rather. Um, Controversial at times question. Um, so in men uh, without a history of prostate cancer, the screening via the BS PSA test uh, decreased the risk of mortality. Um, and I'll come back to that outcome um, shortly. So what do we look out for when critically appraising studies? Uh, I've tried to sum it um, up in one slide um, because I, I think it can be as simple as this. So obviously um, we have our sample of um, participants uh, that we've recruited. So the way in which we've sampled these patients, um, the type of inclusion and exclusion criteria uh, will impact uh, upon uh, the generalizability of the results. So the more focused the um, inclusion criteria is, um, so the tighter the inclusion criteria. So uh, let's say we're only recruiting men age 55 to 60 um, in a met metropolitan area of um, European descent. Um, you could uh, argue that's a fairly tight um, inclusion criteria. So how generalizable those results would be um, is, is rather questionable. So I guess that's the first thing to, to look at is, is how the sampling strategy has been um, adopted. Obviously from that, we'll have our sample and then we'll randomize um, our participants so this is the first um, aspect of critical appraisal that we want to focus on, or the first bias, selection bias. So um, we overcome selection bias firstly by randomization, so hopefully having um, a, a, a fairly transparent way of um, conducting the, the randomization procedure, um, usually computer generated. Uh, but the second aspect which sometimes we forget about is allocation concealment. So the person, um, it, uh, allocated, no pun intended, um, or required to, to undertake the randomization um, is blinded uh, to that process. So they're not randomizing participants in this instance to screening or um, usual care, so no screening. 
Um, one way in which they would be, um, or one way in which you could overcome the allocation uh, bias is to uh, blind the um, uh, randomizers. So they're only randomizing participants to group A or group B. Uh, so there's no way in which we can um, uh, uh, modify that process in any way. Looking at table one, the baseline characteristics, um, if we see no differences, no statistical differences between the two groups, um, we can uh, be fairly confident uh, that the randomization uh, procedure and allocation concealment um, ha has been true. From that, in this case, we've got our two groups, screening versus no screening, or we, we could have titled it screening versus usual care. This is where our second bias uh, comes into play, performance bias. So performance bias relates to the manner in which the intervention is implemented. So obviously, one way in which we can overcome this is by blinding not only uh, the investigators or researchers, but also the participants from knowing whether or not they've been allocated to the intervention group or the comparison group. Ideally, that's what we'd love to do. We'd love to blind. Obviously, there's going to be some instances, such as potentially this one, um, where blinding um, can be difficult, uh, both from an um, investigator research point of view, but also from uh, a, a participant's point of view. Uh, surgery is another classic example. Um, fairly difficult to blind uh, participants uh, into um, knowing whether or not they've been allocated to the surgical group um, or um, non-surgical group. Um, unless, of course, you're going to do a, a sham surgery, but um, that's another story. So from there, we obviously want to follow up our patients. So this brings in this question about duration of follow-up. Um, the length of time, um, is it appropriate? Um, in order to identify the observed outcome. So in this case, if we're screening participants and following them up for a year, uh, one would question whether or not that follow-up or that duration of follow-up is sufficient. Um, another aspect of follow-up is related to attrition bias. So identifying uh, why people or why our participants are dropping out, if at all. So in this case, um, a, a neat tip is to identify or go back to, um, to the number of patients um, who were originally randomised um, and then at the completion of the trial, um, just look up and see whether or not those numbers um, add up um, uh, from the start to the end. Um, if they don't, um, we potentially have a case of attrition bias. So as long as we're, um, or as long as the um, uh, authors are uh, providing us with explanations of why people are dropping out, um, then we can overcome attrition bias. Um, I guess another way um, in which they overcome attrition bias is the intention to treat uh, principle. Uh, so only analysing those patients uh, that were randomised uh, to their respective uh, intervention and control groups. Um, so a lot of times, particularly with screening trials, what we'll see is patients crossing over. So this is where intention to treat bias, sorry, intention, intention to treat analysis comes in really handy because we can identify um, the rate of crossover or the rate of contamination. Um, and that can tell us a lot about the um, effectiveness um, of the intervention um, as well as patient compliance. So all those aspects, I guess, um, to sum it up, uh, relate to attrition bias. Finally, what we're after um, is the outcome. Um, so the outcome of interest here is mortality. Um, and this is where our last um, bias comes into play, that being detection bias. So in this case, what detection bias relates to um, is our outcome assessment. So we've said um, that our outcome here is mortality. Um, so when it comes to detection bias, we want to, uh, I guess, overcome that by ensuring that our assessors, um, when assessing the patients, don't know whether or not they were allocated to the intervention group or the um, comparison or control group. Um, if they did, 
there is a slight chance that they could modify the results. So again, um, if our assessors just know that um, our patient is from group A or group B, um, we reduce the um, uh, potential for any um, uh, modification of uh, results here. Most of the time, um, this is possible. Um, some would argue, uh, depending on the outcome, it may not be necessary. So something like mortality, um, you can't really fudge those results if you're looking at um, registries and whatnot um, that have recorded um, this particular outcome. The last thing I'll, I'll talk about um, just briefly about this question um, and the outcome that we've highlighted here is mortality. Now, we could have gone into much more depth um, and I identified a primary um, outcome or a secondary outcome, splitting mortality either into disease-specific mortality, that being prostate cancer-specific uh, mortality, that is identifying patients who died specifically of prostate cancer, or we could have gone with all-cause mortality. So just looking at differences um, in mortality rates between the two groups, regardless of what disease it was. Um, whether it be prostate cancer or uh, cardiovascular or, or some other um, um, uh, disease. There's great controversy uh, within the literature, uh, particularly around screening trials, whether we go for disease-specific mortality or all-cause mortality. Um, those in the disease-specific um, camp will argue that where um, uh, the, the, the intervention is uh, aiming to reduce disease-specific mortality, hence why you'd only look at disease-specific mortality as the primary outcome. Those in the other camp would argue that all-cause mortality um, should be the primary outcome. Um, the case being that whilst the intervention is aiming to reduce uh, disease-specific mortality, it should also incorporate um, any of the um, adverse events that may occur because of the intervention. Um, so we may have someone who um, is allocated to screening um, but has a, an adverse event related to screening or its treatment um, and therefore um, should, um, should, should, should look at um, all-cause mortality. Um, like I said, great debate on this topic and what I'll do is I'll post up a, um, uh, an article um, and you can make your own choice as to whether you sit on the all-cause side or the disease-specific side. As always, uh, please feel free to contact me via email. Otherwise, I hope you enjoy this uh, particular video. Thank you.